it was probably the race card that got you acquitted. You know, I hear this race card. Let's, let's, let's analyze this so-called race card. The deck, this is called deck. The deck of cards. Cards was, was introduced by the media and the, the so-called pundits immediately. The minute they convened a grand jury, I saw Irina. I saw so many of the pundits and writers uh, in this area write mm -hmm. what that impact would be. Uh, that the case would be downtown instead of in Santa Monica, and it was all under racial uh, lines. I then saw the first hand dealt from that deck, uh, if you don't want to count Mark Furman. Well, uh, I was going to say, media, it was Mark again. Furman, according to you, it was uh, Mark Furman who played the first race card because he possibly. planted the glove because yeah, you're a black possibly. man. Well, you know, you, you're wording it a little differently than I had worded it. And, but, I, and I don't mean to do I, that. I'm but saying you're talking to me about the race card. This race card is not a conversation that uh, I heard Mark Furman speak of. It's no. something I've heard the media speak of. And I'm saying that the media has played it more than anybody. It was mm -hmm. the media that was writing how many blacks were on the jury. These are Americans. What difference should it make? These are the Americans. When this jury was in panel, the first thing, the thing that jumped out at you more than gender was race. And the media talked about it. They brought Mark Furman into this case, and I don't think anybody. Uh, you listen to Marsha Clark's closing arguments. I don't think there's anybody, including the prosecution, that doesn't think that this man is a racist. The prosecution knows it. Listen to Marsha's words in closing arguments. Yet they still, uh, when you put a witness on the stand, my lawyers told me, you're vouching for that witness. We had many witnesses that... We wanted to put on that uh, stand because they had what we thought positive information for me, but we couldn't vouch for them 100%. We mm -hmm. could not vouch for them. We didn't put them on the stand. They still put this man on the stand. You and your lawyers, though, put that jury together. You were as much as part of it, and I'm sure race came into play, didn't it? Oh, obviously, I think uh, you have to look both at sides, it. if you look at uh, the idea when they were dropping people, the prosecution started first, mm -hmm. I think. Probably of their first eight or nine people, seven or eight of them were black. Yeah. You know, and then obviously we sort of caught up. Uh, what did you at want? One point. What, did, what kind of a jury did you want? Did you want a, a, a black jury? Me, primarily I wanted a black fair jury? jury. I wanted a fair jury. Yeah, I would have said, that. at the time though, I was a little more, uh, my eyes may have been open a little more to how much race uh, was impacting. Um, the, the, the perception of this case, uh, I may not have said that right. What I mean to say is in August, long before there were any evidence presented in this case, when you look at the hearing, the, the 911 call, uh, calls, the buying a knife at a knife store and all that, none of that came into, really came into the case, you know. Mm -hmm. But still, 70 to 80 percent of white America had already convicted me. I find that so ironic, so hypocritical for them. That same group of people criticizing this jury, they say they only took two hours, uh, three hours to come to a verdict. That's not enough time. Yet, before there was a jury, before any evidence was presented in court, 80% of from the polls, I don't always believe the polls, but 80% of white America, based on the polls, already had me guilty. And how, how can they say, you know, this jury listened to all the evidence. They didn't hear spin every night mm -hmm. and they didn't sit there and see what Geraldo or somebody wanted you to hear about the trial you know the jury sat there and heard every bit of evidence and you know, I'm, I'm from the sports world mm -hmm. the world I'm from and, and I give speeches and I've given speeches for 30 years everyone who's ever heard me speak many of them I always say accept responsibility for yourself it's, it has some religious overtones because those words came to me in a chapel service in Boston once I tell people don't blame your teacher if you're not getting good grades. Don't blame your coach if you're not uh, playing, or playing up to what you think your ability is. Yet, and I, you, know, you can call it a simple analogy here, yet I watch the prosecution, and people out there who didn't watch this trial want to blame the jury, an American jury of 12 of, their, of Americans, 12 people. We went through the most extensive idea, I think, in the history of, uh, of, of trials. We came up with 12 people who sat through that uh, nine months of what had to be agony, sure. yet they couldn't prove a case. They were wrong to begin with. I was innocent to begin with. They were wrong. It came out. The people heard the evidence, came to that conclusion, at least not guilty. Is this your heart talking, that they came to not guilty because of the evidence or because of race? 
because I, there I are some the evidence. I'm not going to buy into this race There are some who thing. believe that they did it because they were they were fighting for a brother. Fighting for a brother. You know, you tell those people. You go out to whatever neighborhood you want to get, and you show me a person that buy that, and you take them downstairs. In every urban community in this country, Washington, D.C., Chicago, Atlanta, New York City, you'll see in most cases, most cases, the majority, certainly more than that, what is indicative in our population, the majority of jurors are black and now go to jail and see how many blacks are on, on death row. The majority of people on death row are probably black or Hispanic. See, that's total BS. You know, everybody's looking for an excuse not to face the facts. They want to blame the jury. They want to bring black people that were on that jury. Just go into the prisons a day and see how many blacks are in prison. And you go into any courtroom in this country in urban communities. You look at the most serious crimes. You look at the jury. You see black people putting black people in jail daily. I'm sorry. I'm getting a little pissed. That's okay. You're speaking your mind, I assume. Yeah. Well, you know, I, it's, I, I've never accepted excuses in my day. Every person, you talk about these incidents in my life, the 911 call, whatever, no one, no the police officer ever walked up to me didn't say, hey, he made no excuses. He accepted the responsibility. I've done that my entire life, and I'm watching people here trying to judge me who won't take the responsibility, who won't listen to facts, who, who get these skewered opinions that they get on TV, who made up their mind before any evidence was in this case, and then they're going to criticize people. I hear... Goldman, who I have a lot of compassion for, because I know how he feels. Mm -hmm. I lost more than he lost. I lost someone I loved just as much as he loved, and I lost my life for the most part. I'm a little stronger than most people think. I'm not sitting in this house trying to commit suicide, which we'll get to. I'm not sitting around crying the blues uh, uh, about what's been going on. Hey, I'm trying to stand tall, and I'm going to fight what I have to fight. I see he go on TV. I don't know what the man's talking about. He wants 10-2. Hey, I got to tell you, I felt 10-2. Uh, even before this trial happened, I felt that to get 12 people to go one way would be difficult, that they should go to 10-2 or 9-3. 10-2, you're talking about conviction 10-2 in the jury. Conviction yeah. in the jury. I, I, I was a believer in that. I see him go on TV. I don't know what he's talking about. Well, one of the in my case, if it was 10-2, I would have been acquitted in 20 minutes instead of three hours. One of the things he wants, he says, is justice, and he wanted you to take the stand and said that you're a coward for not taking the well, witness stand. Well, he couldn't buy justice. I didn't need to take the witness stand. I have a constitutional right. I wanted to take the witness down. I would love to sit down with Marsha Clark. I would love to sit down with Goldman. I would rather Goldman and Marsha Clark to be sitting right here uh, uh, interviewing me, but they're too busy making money. You know, they don't want to see O.J. try to replenish what he lost. I've, I'm the only person that lost anything financially, me and the taxpayers of this state. I don't see anybody trying to pay the taxpayers or me back. You know, that's all I want to do. I would have loved for Marsha Clark. Tomorrow, if Marsha Clark would sit down and, and talk to me, she can film it as long as I can market it. She can film it and ask me whatever she wants to ask me, and I'll answer every question. Why? Frank Why Goldman, she? let him sit down. He can ask me whatever he wants to ask me. But I'm the only person at law. I'm not out there at this point asking the public to send me money. I'm well, not doing that. Why should I you be able to get make back. money off the tragedy? I'm not of making Ron money Goldman. off of tragedy. What tragedy am I making money off? That's what people will say, O.J. They'll say you're making money off of this now. Oh, the same people who had me uh, convicted, the same people who had me guilty in August of 94. What do they say about Marsha Clark? What do they say about Denise Brown? What do they talk about Faye Resnick? They'll find one thing that they go to and say, I'm not making money for being here tonight. They'll show that on TV. I tell you what, let's take a look at Faye Resnick and Denise Brown's tax returns for the last 10 years and their tax return for this past year. Let's see who's benefiting from this tragedy. Let's take a look at Marsha Clark, who I see has just gotten 42 years of salary. Mm -hmm. 42 years of salary with a book deal. Plus, she's probably going to equal that in her appearance. I don't begrudge her that. I don't begrudge her that, but I begrudge the hypocrites, the hypocrisy that says OJ is making money on this tragedy. No, I'm just trying to replenish what I lost. And you want to hear from me? Hey, you don't have to buy the tape. You know, if you want to hear from me, I'm here to speak. I got two kids, four kids, but two kids that I am the sole uh, supporter of, financial supporter of. The Browns have given them love, have maintained what Nicole and I had given those kids. Those were happy kids when they got them. They're happy kids today. I will always be grateful to the Browns for maintaining what Nicole and I had instilled in our kids. But every month I send a check down there for my kids. Yet I got people out here that are saying that as an American, I can't go out and make money. I was real willing to do an interview free. Those same people are 
picketing outside of the, the network to keep me from doing it free. This is not about making money. This is about what I consider prejudice, prejudice against my rights as an American to earn a living and support my family. I can hear the helicopters uh, overhead. You're a prisoner here. Good time. No, You're I'm a, not prisoner a prisoner here. I am not a prisoner here. I go out. I go out. I go to dinners. I read where the rags once again, I read where, oh, you went the to this tabloids? restaurant, the tabloids, and they, they throw these uh, napkins. I've never been in a restaurant. The restaurant that they said that uh, I've never been in, and every restaurant I've been in mm -hmm. since I've been out, the managers have been courteous. They've been encouraging. They asked me to come back. I've had a great meal. Uh, if I walk out here, if I've seen 1,000 people outside of my house, 995 of those people, white women mm -hmm. from, from Iowa, from Georgia, from Canada, from South Africa even, have all been encouraging, telling me to keep my head up, you know, get your kids, go on So you believe life. there are people who believe in you? Oh, hey, I got over two million pieces of mail from people that, I've, uh, that, yeah. that have sent mail to my house and my office that totally believe in me, and, and many people that, when I was in Panama City, the people were so, so encouraging down mm -hmm. there. It was, it was just mind-boggling. I'm aware of a, of a, of a tabloid mm -hmm. show Given a lady a sign, we have eight witnesses to this, mm -hmm. gave her a sign, had her drive by, go away, OJ, with the sign, and that was the story they got across the country, you know? The day the verdict was read, um, and, and you were set free, there were some people who said it was in very bad taste. Um, I don't know if this happened again. This may be tabloid. This may be reports. Mm -hmm. Toasting champagne, celebrating victory, celebrating vindication. Knowing that... Uh, at least in your mind, the real killers of Nicole were still out there somewhere. Hey, the real killers had been out there for a year and four months. This was, friends, there was nothing planned. Excuse me, there was absolutely nothing planned. I came home to a relatively empty house. I walked through the front door. I saw my long-term assistant, Kathy Rander and Al Cowlings. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Nicole Povers, who was my jailhouse uh, liaison uh, mm -hmm. lawyer, uh, up the front. I walked into this room and stood almost where we're, where we're sitting now, and they pretty much left me alone. Mm -hmm. uh, phone calls were coming that I wasn't taking, a couple of calls I did take from real close friends. I think because of the media outside, people saw I was home and friends began, began to come over. Uh, some friends uh, sent um, food here, and it, it was such a spontaneous thing. You saw balloons and flowers coming, the majority of those balloons and flowers were coming from my neighbors. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to the neighborhood. That's not the report you got uh, from the media. And so it was a total spontaneous thing. And you know what we ended up doing? Mm -hmm. That I, they may have written, written someplace, but I really hadn't read it and I didn't read a lot about uh, what transpired that week. I was focusing on my kids and adjusting. You know what we did? Mm -hmm. We stood in the other room, packed with people. I, probably 50, 100 people, I don't know. We spoke, we prayed, and we sung religious songs. That's not the image the press gave America, though, did they? They gave champagne and partying and dancing. No, we sung religious songs. We prayed together as a group. That's what we did in this house that day. Yes, there was a, a jubilant feeling. I was home. Yes, and I felt it to an extent. I was still No apologies numb. for that. Huh? Absolutely none. None. Do you think... I mean, I'm looking at Denise Brown and Faye Russell going to parties, starting love affairs, going out of love. Why, why shouldn't they have the right to do that? Yeah. Why shouldn't they have the right? I see Denise Brown in court to testify for her sister's death, slipping a number to Tony the Animal somebody, right? I mean, I don't see anybody criticizing that. I don't, you know, I, I, you know picking up a guy at her sister's, her ex-brother-in-law's trial for the murder of her sister, picking a guy up under those circumstances, and I'm being criticized because friends are here praying with me, singing songs that I'm home, that I've been, mm -hmm. in my mind and in their mind, vindicated. Doesn't, doesn't wash with you. Doesn't wash with me at all. If you didn't do this horrible crime, who did? Who killed Nicole? Who killed Ron Goldman? I wouldn't be sitting here with you now if I knew. I will say this. I have absolutely no doubt, I think if you talk to some people who have been close to Nicole the last four years, they feel the same way, that the answer is somewhere in the world of Faye Rusnick, no doubt. 
you talk about coincidences. How much of a coincidence is it that roughly 10 days before Nicole's death, uh, I'm on the phone with Faye Rustness. She's crying to me, yeah. begging me to talk to her boyfriend to marry her. Yeah. A guy who is a great guy, Kristen Reichardt. Kristen Reichardt. Nobody has anything bad to say about Kristen. Impeccable record, great guy. Yeah. Kristen couldn't do it because she had problems. She moved out of that house moved in with Nicole for the weekend. I don't know how long she had moved in. Just mm -hmm. Nicole, she was a friend, Nicole brought her in. Four days later, even though Nicole often complained and knew all about this woman's drug problems, Nicole saw fit to call friends together to put this girl away because it was totally... To have an intervention? She was totally out of control with it. Nicole called her friends mm -hmm. together. The next day they put this woman in a, in, a, in a rehab center. Three days after that, Uh, Sydney Brooke, my daughter, mm -hmm. stated that probably the last time she heard her mother, her mother was crying. You know, we know now that that was in all likelihood Faye Rusnick who claims that Nicole was giggling. This woman is in a rehab center. Nicole wouldn't be on the phone with her giggling. And any mother out there that got an eight-year-old daughter. You, your daughter know if you're crying or if you're giggling. My daughter, Sydney, is a sharp girl. She knows if her mother is dying or, or, or giggling, or crying rather, or giggling. And within hours of this, Nicole's dead. Now, what happens after this? This woman claims that she was fearing for her life from AC and Bob Shapiro, for God's sake. She runs away. She runs and goes into hiding and begins to spin her yarn, and hey, we can go through her story. Sure, you're going to hear a lot about this in this civil trial and obviously some other civil trials. You think I had a dream team before. Wait till you see my litigators with the tabloids and people like Faye Rusnick. Uh, this woman flat out lied. I'm, I'm calling her a liar. Her book, I can show you, it's provable. The prosecutions are lied. Her best, what she claimed to be her best friend is murdered. If she know nothing about it, why does she have to lie? Go to Cora Fishman, Nicole's best friend. Nobody doubts that. Mm -hmm. Nicole spent more time with Cora Fishman than any other person other than her kids and maybe me from time to time in the last four years of her life. Find out if the things that this girl has said about Nicole are true. This girl just lied and lied and lied. And I asked myself, why? If you're innocent, if you don't know nothing, why do you run and hide and say your life is in danger? And why do you lie? time and time again. And it hurts me because I wasn't speaking to Nicole in the end because of Faye Rusnick. Because Faye Rusnick asked me, wanted to know why she wasn't invited to an affair that I had invited Christian and Dr. Fishman and his son to, and I hadn't mm -hmm. invited the girls because they're Nicole's friends, and I was going to be with Paula Barbieri. Faye Rusnick, Christian was there, said, I want to go. Hey, we don't play that. We love you, OJ. We love Nicole. I want to get to know Paula. I want to get to know Nicole's Whoever she ends up with. I invite her. Nicole calls me and screams at it's, me because mm -hmm. Faye tells her a total different story. When I asked Faye, what, what, didn't you tell her you, were in, you invited yourself? She said, oh, come on, OJ. This is a week before her murder. Mm -hmm. Come on, OJ. Nicole loves you. You're back with Paula. She loves you. I say, Faye, do me a favor. Call Nicole and tell her you insisted on going to this affair. Now, that's not the story you've been getting from Faye Rusnick, is it? But fortunately for me, there were witnesses to all mm -hmm. of this. Again, it's you. Well, first of all, you don't have any proof that Faye Resnick was. Involved. Oh, it's like I who what proof right. that I murdered anybody. I mean, everybody. We could well, you can use the same circumstantial evidence for Faye Resnick. We can look at her past. Mm -hmm. and we find out that anything remotely like this might have happened in uh, San Francisco. Did she ever leave the country before because of something that might have happened? I don't know. Why don't we take a look at these investigative uh, journalists out there? Uh, these tabloid shows, why don't we go and take a look at it? Why don't we just go and see? Or the police. Why don't we in, or the police. I ask you a what, question. Why? Have you seen anywhere, have you seen written anywhere where Marsha Clark, Phil Van Adder, Phillips, uh, Darden, anybody ever asked Faye Rusnick who delivered her drugs? We know she was broke. That's, mm -hmm. everybody knows she was broke. We know it's expensive to do the type of things that she uh, was doing at the time, allegedly, but they had an intervention. Evidently, she admitted it. Nicole took them to her stash. Mm -hmm. I got a question. Did they ever ask the question, did anybody deliver you drugs this week? I'm not aware of it, but again... Uh, but this is the most thoroughly investigated case of all time, yes. This is your contention, that she was... She and Ron Goldman, Nicole and Ron Goldman, oh, I don't were know about killed... Ron Goldman. I, but they were killed accidentally. 
I don't in a know. sense. I don't know. I can't talk about that. I, I have absolutely no idea. I know Nicole is a confrontational person. She always has been. She's been confrontational with house help. Mm -hmm. I noticed that the rags hadn't gone to all the housekeepers and all the nannies who've worked in this house. All of them will give you a totally different story. Mm -hmm. And many of them have, even in Europe, who live in Europe now. I've given you a totally different story than what the tabloids have been mm -hmm. telling you about my relationship with Nicole and who was aggressive and who was not aggressive uh, uh, in this household. I don't, I, I don't know. I just know if someone came to that house looking for Faye, doing whatever, mm -hmm. Nicole would have been very confrontational with her because that was her nature. Well, I knew that we would never have enough time to talk about everything yeah. in, in 90 minutes, approximately. It's frustrating let, for me because I try to say everything. Let me do one thing, though. And, and this, we can talk for hours. We can talk about evidence. People will still have questions. They'll have their own opinions. Let me look directly into the eyes of O.J. Simpson. Like so many people watching this tape are doing right this minute and say to you, did you kill Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman? Absolutely not. I couldn't kill anyone. I couldn't do it. You know, one of the things that probably saved my life when I was in that orange grove was that my mother always told me if people who commit suicide can't go to heaven. I expect, hopefully, I pray that one day I'll see Nicole again. I have no doubt that's where she is. I couldn't kill anybody. No matter what you no say or do. What, you no know, matter what you say or do, though, there are people that they'll, are they'll not going to believe you. They'll, they'll believe it, you know, and hey, I can't help that. I can just say to them, look at my history. Not the history that a Tammy Bruce is trying to create. But let's look at the facts. People lived in this house. Go to all the people who ever lived with Nicole and I. Go to all of her friends. You know, go to Nicole's words and things like her divorce deposition or these spontaneous utterances that she made at the 911 call where there was absolutely nothing in 93 physical that happened between us. You go to all of these people uh, and find out. See the nature of me. I can tell you honestly that other than my 89 thing with Nicole, once on a football field with Mel Lunksford, Mel, sorry to bring your name up, I had a fight with a guy named Mel Lunksford on the football field, three, four inches taller than I, 50 pounds heavier than I. I can tell you in my adult life, I never had a fight with anybody. Everybody got along with me. Everyone who's ever worked in this house would tell you, if anything, I was a peacemaker in this house. My history, you talk about my history, that is my history. You talk to people who live with me, you talk to people who work with me, you talk to people in my public. That was my history. I didn't get into confrontations. You know, I've had my arguments with Nicole. Or Nicole has had her arguments with many people, with house help, with her mother. But Nicole was a strong woman, and she... I can tell you this, I say this without any reservation. I think if you go to any friend of hers, somebody like Tammy Bruce, Nicole would punch her. <laughs> Nicole would punch her right in her she face. She could push your buttons too, couldn't she, OJ? Nicole. Oh, yes. oh yeah. Oh, yes, she could. But not Do you know anybody that's been with a woman for, for 15, 17 years that the woman couldn't push his buttons? But not enough to kill her? Not enough not to get enough, that angry? Not enough really to, to hit her or to purposely injure her. Never. Even in 89, my pro my... My goal in 89 was just to get her out of my bedroom, not to hurt her. You're the only one who knows, really, the truth of what no, you're No, no, there's somebody else that knows the truth. Who's that? It's a, the person who killed them. Yeah. You can live with yourself? <sighs> yes. I think I've been a good guy. I think I've been a good person. I think my life has shown it. I believe in God. God has been with me. He's made me strong. I hope. Even today, I, I kind of, there's things I don't like what I said today because I, I don't want to go to certain people's levels. And today, I think I did. Uh, but I've had so much in me, so much stored in me, there's so much more that I want to say. And I kind of apologize if I got a little carried away there. But that's me. That's anybody who's ever played golf with me. Everybody who knows me know that. I'm not a guy, I say what's on my mind, everybody knows where they stand with me, and I like to think I've been supportive of everybody, even people who have been critical of me, uh, virtually every one of them, I could tell you a time, and they would agree that they came to me for help when they were in women, friends of Nicole's, who I think probably feel that I'm guilty, that when they were at places in their lives where, when even Nicole wouldn't speak to them. You, you ask Chris Jenner. Uh, they came to me, and I was there for them. You didn't kill her? No, I did not kill anybody. I could not and would not. 
Thank you for your time, yeah. Andre. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Now, this is the uh, Rockingham Gate to my home. It's west of the house. Uh, we actually used it as an exit. And it was on this street, Rockingham, that Allen Park drove uh, up that night of the 12th. And uh, Allen Park was pretty consistent in his testimony, and as well as uh, what he told the police in the first interview that he did uh, throughout the trial. And Marsha Clark was almost as consistent with her misrepresentation of this uh, person's um, um, uh, testimony, and it seems strange to me that the that the press or many of the pundits around the country chose to go with Marsha's misrepresentations instead of uh, Alan Park's actual testimony. One thing Alan said was when he drove up this street, he didn't notice any cars on Rockingham, and he did not notice a Bronco. He didn't notice it when he drove up. He didn't notice it at one point when he drove down the middle of the street. Curiously, not along the curb when he wanted to look through this gate to see if he can see anyone in my house. I submit that uh, he rode, came back in the middle of the street because the Bronco would have blocked him riding along the curb. But he also, more importantly, stated that he didn't notice this Bronco when he drove out of the Rockingham gate at a time when I think everybody agreed that the Bronco was there. I find very interesting that uh, if this Bronco was parked askew, as the police uh, time and time again stated. Now, you look at this parking job. I mean, you would, you, you'd you have to be, I mean, with the parking police to say that this is a bad parking job. This is a truck, and I submit it'd be pretty difficult to drive up and uh, park a car much better than this parking job. A couple of other points about this Bronco is that uh, uh, a lot of talk about the mixed blood stains that were, were on the console. You realize there was only seven-tenths of one drop of blood on that console. I can literally sneeze in my hand, rub it around that console, and you would probably have more DNA. Another uh, incident that uh, came about because of the Bronco, and I found it very uh, indicative of everything that happened in this case and how members of the media and pundits around this country were so quick to jump on any negative, anything that may have made me look uh, more guilty. Uh, was this body bag, this plastic bag, and this shovel that they found uh, in the back of my Bronco. Now, they investigated this case for seven months, seven or eight months uh, before we got to trial. They said it was an exhaustive investigation. Yet, that Friday, they showed the jury, they sprang in front of the jury and the nation, this plastic bag, which they tried to imply uh, could have been used as a body bag, and this shovel that was in the back of my car. And of course, the media that weekend just went wild with it, and I would assume most of the people around the country who thought I was guilty say, see, what did I tell you? Well, over the weekend, they discovered that this plastic bag uh, came with every Bronco. It was standard equipment. It came, uh, it had something to do with the spare tire, and of course the shovel was not a shovel that you would use to dig holes. It was a mucking shovel that you would use to uh, pick up stuff. In my case, uh, we call it a pooper scooper, and I actually had it in the back of my car because I was going over to Nicole's house. She was having some trouble with the neighbor to the north of her because the dogs were, you know, doing their do around there, and uh, this disgruntled ex-husband was going over there picking up uh, the dog do for her. Uh, let's go back in and some other interesting things that I can point out to you out here. Uh, some of it has to do with this driveway. Uh, before I show you some blood drops that were found uh, on the property, let's talk a little about uh, some of the evidence and things that came out in court. One, that you cannot age blood drops. You can't really tell when they were deposited. For instance, uh, two blood drops were found here side by side, and you really couldn't tell um, when, if they were deposited at the same time or not. Uh, one thing is curious to me that these were side by side, which would indicate someone was bleeding from two sides of their body, I guess. Uh, as we go down the driveway, we have cards where they found various blood drops. <laughs> Here's one here, and then there's other cards going towards uh, the front of the house. One thing that really jumps out at you is that none of these blood drops go in this direction to the side of the garage where Mark Furman allegedly found uh, the bloody glove. 
Some other points I should make about the blood. All the blood, the blood drops going along the side of Nicole's house towards her alley. Uh, the blood drops that are on this uh, driveway um, going in various directions uh, to or from my front door. Um, the blood splattered Bronco. My blood splattered home. All of this blood constitutes less than 15 drops of blood. Less than 15 drops. Now, when you talk about the uh, estimated one and a half cc's of blood that was missing from the blood vial, that would constitute something like 30 drops of blood. And when you talk about that blood vial, Philip Van Adder, an experienced investigator, for the first time in his career, decided to bring the blood vial from downtown where he could have booked it out here to my home when he didn't even know if uh, Dennis Wong would still be here. I find that very unusual. Since we're out here, let's talk about some observations that Alan Park may have had. Uh, this is my car. It's a uh, Bentley. Uh, and I'm talking about Alan Park here. Alan Park, I felt, was an honest witness who just made some uh, honest observational mistakes. As we know, uh, his comments about the uh, Bronco on the street, he didn't notice it coming or going. He stated uh, that he felt that there were two cars parked here. Well, he was wrong. There was only one car parked here. Arnell, my daughter, didn't return home to about 1 o'clock that night, and I can only assume that his mistake came about because he saw pictures of, uh, that the prosecution took uh, when he was up in their office. I think Cato Kalin would tell you there were only one car parked here. I would go on to say that he was driving a stretch limo. Now, normally, if there were two cars parked here correctly, you cannot get a stretch limo through my driveway. It's just a little too tight uh, back there by the garage, and most uh, limo drivers that come here, if they're driving a stretch, they have to back in on Ashford and then drive out of Ashford. This is a picture that the prosecution took of my car and my daughter's car as they were parked that morning. Now, you couldn't even get a normal car around that curve uh, the way these two cars were parked. Another point I want to make about Alan Park, who once again, I think, was an honest witness. I just think he made a couple of honest observational mistakes. He was pretty vehement on the stand that the golf bag that we showed him in court was not the golf bag that I had. He did state that it was a Swiss Army knife golf bag, but this is not the bag, I think was his uh, exact words, and he was pretty vehement about that. Well, Swiss Army Knife only had a few golf bags. They had just recently sent me that golf bag uh, as a gift. It's the only golf bag that Swiss Army makes. There's no other. There could have been no other. So here's a guy who felt that he observed some things. Uh, he was wrong. He had no ax to grind one way or the other. I just feel it was an honest mistake. He was not a detective. He was here just to pick up a customer and take him to the airport, and there's no reason for him to you know, be tested uh, on his observational skills, and unfortunately, uh, he made a few mistakes. Now, since we're outside, let's go back to what I thought was uh, some of the more informative uh, uh, evidence that something funny went on during this investigation. I want you to assume that perhaps at some time, since 1985 or 6, you addressed a member of the African-American race as a nigger. Is it possible that you have forgotten that act on your part? No, it's not possible. Are you therefore saying that you have not used that word in the past 10 years, Detective Furman? Yes, that's what I'm saying. And you say on your oath that you have not addressed any black person as a nigger or spoken about black people as niggers in the past 10 years, Detective Furman? That's what I'm saying, sir. So that anyone who comes to this court and quotes you as using that word in dealing with African Americans would be a liar, would they not, Detective Furman? Yes, they would. All of them, correct? All of them. All right. Was the testimony that you gave at the preliminary hearing in this case completely truthful? I wish to assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. Have you ever falsified a police report? I wish to assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. Is it your intention to assert your Fifth Amendment privilege with respect to all questions that I ask you? Yes. Uh, Detective Furman, did you plant or manufacture any evidence in this case? I assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. And let me come back to Mark Furman for a minute, just so it's clear. Did he lie when he testified here in this courtroom saying that he did not use racial epithets in the last 10 years? Yes. Is he a racist? 
Yes. Is he the worst LAPD has to offer? Yes. Do we wish that this person was never hired by LAPD? Yes. Should LAPD have ever hired him? No. Should such a person be a police officer? No. In fact, do we wish there were no such person on the planet? Yes. Now we're going to walk down the uh, alleyway, or I guess sidewalk, to the south of my house where Furman supposedly found the glove. First thing I want to draw your attention to is there's a door here that goes into my garage and then uh, goes in, you can go into my house that way. Obviously, if I had committed these murders and I was trying to get into my house undetected with a limo driver uh, with an un unobstructed view looking down my driveway, I could have gone through this door. The prosecution made a big deal about this door, saying there was a lot of stuff on the other side so that you couldn't get in this door. But as you can see, it opens outward, not inward. So it would have been no problem to go in there and negotiate some of the items that were on the other side uh, if I wanted to get into my house that night. Now, as we walk down this walkway, you'll see there's a lot of debris, and uh, I have old pavers here, some old bricks here. Um, one thing that's very interesting, there was no blood drops detected anywhere along this walkway. Here, let's take time and look at another door. This door goes into my washroom. Uh, uh, which is obviously inside my house. If you recall, Darden was making a big deal about uh, some clothes that was in my washer, trying to imply they may have been mine. And in closer inspection, we saw that there were panties and things. They were my daughter's Arnell's clothes. And, of course, that's another one of these uh, uh, theories or, or what they call Kodak moments in, in the trial that didn't go for the prosecution, that they thought uh, with all that investigation they had figured something out. 